of the essential nutrients. B vitamins, for example, the amount of coffee I drink in a day provides me something like 30 to 40 milligrams of niacin. It's probably the most concentrated source of magnesium that we can get safely. So for um, some of the B vitamins, especially niacin and minerals, especially magnesium, even decaffeinated coffee is a great nutritional supplement. This is good news. I drink two cups a day in the morning, and I just love my coffee. (laughs) Several studies find that more than five cups a day, people who drink the most have the least Alzheimer's disease and uh, Parkinson's disease and thyroid cancer and liver disease and so on. I probably couldn't do five cups a day. I would have the jitters. I think I'd be jumping up and down and running around and not quite as productive, but maybe I would be. But two is good for me. Do you drink five cups a day? I try to. See, you do practice what you preach. (laughs) You're an artist. Tell us a little bit about your work in art, what you've been doing. You spend a lot of time on your artwork. Yeah, I found years ago that reading affects the mind in some not beneficial ways. And I found that if I would take a break from reading and talking and writing and do sculpture or painting, that it would prevent the brain damage from too much verbalization. And alternating between painting and sculpture is good because you have different approaches to dimensional thinking. And using the verbal part of your brain too much tends to uh, deepen the ruts and you can sort of jump out of old ruts if you paint or sculpt for a while. Well, I never knew myself to be a painter or a sculptress, but I will certainly try to get out of the verbal mode, at least for purposes of this show and other communication. I think I'm okay with that, but I'd like to learn how to paint. I know it's relaxing, and it stimulates your imagination, doesn't it? Yeah. When I was um, a kid, I wanted to be a portrait painter, and I actually did that for several months, and I found that the only people who could afford to have their portrait painted wanted you to uh, represent their social status rather than the truth about them. (laughs) Uh, So when I would paint cute kids, the parents loved it, but when I would paint piggish-looking kids, parents hated it. (laughs) (laughs) You spend a lot of time in Mexico still? Yeah, yeah. For rejuvenation or... The high altitude. One of my areas of study for the last 15 years or so has been carbon dioxide. And high altitude cures everything if you can get high enough. For example, I used to notice that every time I went up to about 8,000 feet altitude, my myopia would quickly improve. I had been using 12 diopter negative correction for nearsightedness. And after a summer in Mexico, it had gone down to nine diopters, just a tremendous improvement in a few months. And people going on just ski vacations for a few days, they've measured that the um, myopia will improve by a diopter or so almost immediately. Do you think it has to do with oxygen or you're saying it has to do with CO2? CO2, in as the oxygen gets thinner, the carbon dioxide is retained in your tissues instead of being displaced. We're all being slightly oxygen poisoned chronically at sea level. And in hospitals, that was demonstrated in the 1930s and 40s that you should never give a sick person pure oxygen, should have 6% or 7% carbon dioxide added. But just in the last few years, that information is being recovered, but still most hospitals are killing patients by giving them pure oxygen when they really should have it always about 5 or 6% carbon dioxide. Well, don't forget that our EPA has now called carbon dioxide a toxin, even though it's food for plants and has created it as a boogeyman. So I would imagine there would be a distance from it since there's so much misinformation about it. Yeah, the whole culture after 1950 forgot the research that had been done showing that, for example, you can cure mountain sickness supplementing carbon dioxide instead of oxygen. I don't remember the Italian's name, but he was the first one around 1900 to cure altitude sickness with a carbon dioxide supplement. 
and then on one of the Everest expeditions where they'd been putting people in a plastic bag full of oxygen when they couldn't take them to a lower altitude, it turned out that breathing inside the plastic bag, they were providing their own carbon dioxide therapy. After that was discovered, a few people would, when they would go to a high altitude for a ski vacation, they would take a little pressure canister of carbon dioxide with them instead of a big tank of oxygen. How interesting. I actually interviewed the founder of the Everest Peace Project, and I think I'm going to pass that on to him. Yeah, there are a few publications available now on the Internet describing that. I have friends who have found that it's a very quick and convenient way to prevent or cure altitude sickness. I also noticed you wrote an article about the eyes. I understand that you're talking about CO2 being a remedy and getting to higher altitudes being a remedy for myopia. Is there anything else about the eyes that you can share with us? Ultraviolet light is damaging, so is blue light. And the reason they damage the tissues of the eye, especially in old age, is that the tissues have become increasingly unsaturated in the fats. The long chain polyunsaturated fats are damaged even by blue light, which does get to the retina where ultraviolet mostly is stopped in the cornea and lens. And the ultraviolet will accelerate the formation of cataracts in the lens. But even the blue light, if it's very bright, and the person has become saturated with unsaturated fats, then the blue light is going to contribute to damage of the retina. You know, you're a very interesting man to listen to and to talk with, and I want to really invite you back at a later time to talk about some more of your research. And I want to thank you for taking your time to be with us today and to share. I know that you don't spend a lot of your time with people from the media, and understandably, But I wanted to tell the public that if you would like to read Ray Pete's articles or books, you can go to raypeat.com, raypeat, P-E-A-T, dot com, and read about his background and research. Ray, I just want to thank you again for your gracious time today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much.